Hello, this is Mr. Kays, and this is 21.1b. 21.1b. Last time we met, we looked at uh, Spain getting wealthy, but Spain having troubles because they they uh, kicked out the Jews and the Muslims, so they didn't have professional people. They had to spend their money outside of the country, making their enemies rich. Oh, things were so bad. And it even got to be bad that they lost control of the Netherlands and uh, the northern provinces were able to break away and form the country of the Netherlands and the southern stayed with uh, Spain and became Belgium. Now today we're going to look at that prosperity of the Dutch. Um, you need to realize that the Dutch um, were different. Um, one thing, they practiced religious toleration, not so in Spain. Um, the United Provinces were not kingdoms but republics. Each province's had elected governors and uh, had the support of merchants and landholders, so it was vastly different than Spain. And since they had the stability of government, they were free to prosper, really. So the religious toleration was practiced in Netherlands, religious toleration. And the Dutch traders made the Netherlands a center of European trade and banking. The Dutch traders made the Netherlands a center of European trade and banking. As I said before, the stability of the government allowed the people to focus on economic growth. They didn't have to worry about an unstable government. With the stability, they could focus on economic growth. And since the Dutch had access to the ocean or the sea, the Dutch had... Um, the largest fleet of ships in the world. The Dutch had the largest fleet of ships in the world. Now you can put in parenthesis merchants. Not necessarily navy, but merchant fleet. Because they were going to go get raw materials and bring them back to the motherland. Specifically spices. Okay, we talked about Spanish art. Let's talk about Dutch art. Dutch art flourished in a climate of prosperity. What I'm trying to say is there were rich merchants and they paid a lot of money to artists to create beautiful art. During the 1600s, the Netherlands became what Florence had been in the 1400s. Let me say that again. During the 1600s, the Netherlands became what Florence had been in the 1400s. They had wealthy patrons. Wealthy patrons. Um, just to talk about a couple specific painters, Rembrandt van Rijn was a famous portraitist. Uh, he was famous for group portraits. On page 516, you can see a group of uh, politicians or city fathers called the syndics. They were officials, and they're dressed up like they, um, almost like they're Puritans or, or uh, pilgrims. They have the black hats and the white collars and the black coats and, and whatever, but that he was famous for his uh, portrait painting of groups. Rembrandt van Rijn, and you can also put down he had very many, uh, uh, a lot of contrast of light. You can see it in that painting called The Syndics, Darkness and Light. Uh, one of my favorites is Jan Vermeer. He was a Dutch artist who um, had a lifestyle portrait of everyday folk. Instead of royalty, he painted pictures of everyday folk. Um, you might have seen the movie with uh, um, uh, called A Girl with a Pearl Earring. In fact, on the front of your textbook, it shows a portrait of Jan Vermeer with A uh, Girl with a Pearl Earring. And, uh, well, we've got that portrait right here. The movie Girl with a Pearl Ear Earring was based on Jan Vermeer's life. And the character here in the picture uh, was actually portrayed by Scarlett Johansson. It's a very good movie. Um, so those are two important Dutch artists. Now, we're going to talk about absolutism. When I think of absolutism, I think of absolute. And that's probably how you should think of it, too. It's the idea that, uh, well, we'll talk about that. Let's keep on going. Absolute monarchs. You know a monarch is a king, so... Absolute monarchs were kings or queens believing that all power within the state was theirs. 
They were kings or queens that believed all power within the state was theirs. Um, they might have advisors, but in the end, they make the choice. They call the shots. They are top dogs. Let's talk about divine right. Divine means God, and right means your, well, you're right, I guess. <laughs> so for divine right, it's the idea that God created the monarchy, or God created kings. They were his representatives on earth. They were his reps or um, mouthpieces on earth. And they answer to God only. They don't answer to their citizens. They don't answer to the law. They don't answer to uh, nobles. They answer to God. The idea is this. God put me on the throne until such time as he takes me out. Shut up and obey. Okay. Now, why did this start? You had growing power of Europe's monarchs. You're going to start to see more and more of these kings consolidate power. Why? Well, because you have the decline of feudalism. F-E-U-D-A-L-I-S-M. Feudalism. The decline of feudalism. In addition, well, let's keep on going, first of all. The decline of feudalism. The rise of cities and the growth of national kingdoms aided in centralizing authority. The decline of feudalism, the rise of cities, and the growth of national kingdoms aided in centralizing authority. Kings were gaining more power. Nobles were losing it. In addition, the growing middle class usually backed monarchs for reasons of trade. They weren't stupid. The middle class knew where their bread was buttered, and they backed kings or monarchs for reasons of trade, so they could make money. So kings gained power. You also have some crises or crises that lead to absolutism. Both the centralization of state authority and crises in Europe, like religious wars, political wars, famines, um, economic downturns, crises in Europe, fueled the growth of absolute rule, both the centralization of state authority and crises in Europe fueled the growth of state of absolute rule. Religious and territorial conflicts conflicts between the states led to continuous warfare. Religious and territorial conflicts between the states led to continuous warfare. And people, quite frankly, were sick and tired of war. They wanted peace. So absolute ruler's goal was to free themselves from the limitations imposed by nobles and lawmaking bodies like the parliament. Absolute rulers' goals were to free themselves from the limitations imposed by nobles and lawmaking bodies. So hold on to your hats, folks. You're going to start to see kings and queens gain more power than the church, the nobles, and lawmaking bodies in general. That is the creation of absolutism. And we're going to have that all the way from roughly the, well, into the 1600s and all the way till uh, Louis the Sixteenth loses his head in France. But that's for another day. This is Mr. K's 21.1B signing off. I'm out.